we're going to take Mn to now be an n by n Bernoulli matrix. So a square matrix of plus and minus ones. And uh, we're interested in, so what is the behavior? the smallest singular value. Okay, so in the rectangular case, um, the, the smallest singular value was of size root n uh, with my normalizations. Um, but now it's actually a lot smaller. So um, you can use the moment method to understand the, the bulk distribution. So the, uh, if you look at all the, if you look at the, um, the singular values, um, um, all, all, all n of them at the same time, uh, the distribution of the entire eigenvalues um, if you normalize by, by root n, uh, converges to what's called the quarter circle law. Special case of the Marchenko Pasteur law. Um, so, actually, what, what, what happens is that actually it's uh, um, instead of a semicircle, which is what happens to the eigenvalues of a, of a Hermitian matrix, for a non Hermitian matrix, if you take the singular values, of course, it has to be positive, not negative, um, it turns out that the eigenvalues um, are distributed according to this, uh, this, this, this quarter circle um, in the uh, square case. In the rectangular case, there's, there's a gap between 0 and uh, um, here. But, but in the square case, it, it, it goes out like this. So you expect the n eigenvalues to be roughly spread out uniformly. So this, this suggests, this suggests that the smallest singular value should be of size about 1 on root n, because um, the largest one is of size root n, and then there are n um, num uh, singular values dis distributed roughly uh, um, with more or less bounded density. So you would expect uh, size 1 over root n. But uh, this, this by itself isn't, uh, isn't the proof. Um, if you get a, a sufficiently good local version of a quarter circle law, you can get close to this. Um, but anyway, uh, this is, but, um, uh, but this is actually the truth. So uh, what, what we actually know now is that, um, oh, so I, sh I should have mentioned, by the way, I forgot to mention the, um, uh, the results on rectangular matrices that I mentioned uh, in the first lecture um, are due to, uh, to uh, Payor, Lidvak, uh, Rudelson, and uh, Tom Jack, uh, uh, Jagerman. But, um, okay, but thanks to the work of uh, Rudelson Vashainen, we now know Pretty much, uh, we have a good understanding of of, uh, of, of this too. So, um, okay, um, we do know that that the singular value here is um, uh, is of size root n. Um, so, um, let me just say a weak version of this. Okay, so uh, how should I say this? Okay, so if uh, Epsilon is zero. If you have any epsilon and if lambda is sufficiently small, uh, let's say sufficiently uh, yeah, small. Okay. Uh, and, and sufficiently large. Okay. Then uh, the probability, probability that the singular value is less than, say, uh, lambda over root n is small, it's less than epsilon, and also the um, there's also a, a bound in the opposite direction. Uh, the, probability, the probability that the single value is much larger than root n, let's say one of the lambda root n, is also small. Okay, so the, the least singular value is usually between, uh, yeah, so um, it's usually of the order of one of root n. It is not much smaller or not much bigger than that. Okay, uh, in fact, there is, uh, we can say more now. In fact, we, we now know, in fact, um, sort of a central limit theorem. We, ha we have an asymptotic. Uh, um, distribution for the uh, uh, least singular value, uh, which is discussed in the notes, but I, th I think uh, I will not reach it in this lecture. So um, I, would, I would just, in fact, I, um, I won't. Also, I probably won't, also won't focus on. I uh, won't be able to reach the uh, the upper tail. So I'm going to focus mostly on the um, lower tail, which is actually the, the type of result which, which is uh, uh, most important for the application to the circular law. Um, so this is a qualitative version of, of, of the theorem in which we, um, I, don't, I don't specify the precise relationship between um, lambda and epsilon. Um, so in fact, actually, the, um, there's, there's a more precise statement. Okay. 
Okay, so there is, there is actually um, a more precise relationship. The, the, uh, the, um, as you send epsilon to zero, the, um, the lower tail actually decays linearly uh, until, uh, well, for, for, for quite a long time, until epsilon becomes exponentially small, at which point uh, there's, a, there's, an, there's an extra term that, that kicks in. So th um, we actually have a much stronger estimate, um, which was proven by Rudis and Bashainen. But um, I will just focus on this more qualitative bound here. Okay, so uh, for, for this type of result, the, the epsilon net type argument that, I, that works in the rectangular case um, doesn't really work all that well here. Um, it's just the, uh, um, the, uh, the probability for an individual, um, you know, so you, 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 know, you can, again, try to understand the prob probability that an individual vector is, uh, is, is small and take the union, union of a silver sum net, but now the, um, the probability of each individual event like this is, is, uh, is not all that small, um, whereas the entropy is still exponentially big. Um, and so direct application of the um, uh, epsilon net argument doesn't, is not all that effective. Um, the problem is that there's just too many x's, um, and you, you need a way to cut down some of the, um, um, some of the entropy to a more reasonable level. And what ends up working is um, you, you, you should split up your, your matrix into various rows, and you use some of the rows to work out what x should be. And then, um, uh, um, and, and in fact, if you do it correctly, you can make x more or less determined uh, precisely by some, some portion of the rows. And then you, you, just, you, you just try to figure out what happens, uh, how x interacts with the remain, remaining rows of, uh, of your matrix. OK, so to, to, to illustrate the idea, um, let me first um, prove a, a simpler result, which is due to Komolos. Like 60, 67, I think. So th this was like, uh, I forget that the uh, precise. Was the, do I have the, uh, the year? Sorry. Yeah, so this was like 2008. Um, Okay, and the result I'm going to mention, which is a lot simpler, or what is it? Yeah, it's 67. Okay, so um, as a special, you know, so rather than 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 uh, than, than bound the lower tail, you can you can look at the most extreme case. Of when the um, uh, of, of when the singular value is actually at least single value is actually zero. Um, so of course this is of course weaker than uh, than this. Uh, again, assuming n is sufficiently big, depending on epsilon. Uh, in fact, if, if you actually work out the arguments that Komolos gives precisely, uh, the, uh, you actually get a more uh, explicit decay rate. Uh, that the, the singularity probability uh, of this um, uh, yeah. So so this is the, the same thing as the probability that m n is singular. Okay, so you, you take a, a random n by n matrix of signs and you ask when is, is this singular? And uh, yeah, so come on, show that this, this actually goes to zero, um, which makes sense because the, uh, the set of singular matrices uh, is, is a small subset of a set of all matrices. Okay, it's, it's, it's a measure zero set, for instance. Um, so if you had a continuous matrix, then certainly for a continuous uh, random matrix, the, the probability of being singular would be zero. For example, for a Gaussian matrix, it would be zero. But for a discrete matrix, it's, it's not zero. Um, and so Komlosh proved the, uh, uh, the bound uh, one, uh, a constant over root n, in fact. Um, it's not actually known exactly what the rate is. Um, so um, if you have a plus, plus or minus one random matrix, um, it can actually be singular. Uh, for example, if two rows are the same, for example, if the first two rows are the same, then the matrix would be singular. So, um, there's, uh, so there's certainly a lower bound, for example, of two, of two to the minus n. Um, and because there's different pairs of rows, you can actually like get, maybe upgrade this like maybe n choose two, uh, give or take a small error. Um, and it's actually conjectured that this is basically the truth. Okay, so it's conjectured that the singularity probability should actually basically be, be one half to the n. It should decay like like one over two to the n. That 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 the, the, the easiest way to make a random sign matrix singular is to make two of the rows the same, or maybe, uh, maybe one of the rows in the negative of the other. Um, 
So this is not known. Uh, there's been st steady improvements to this bound uh, over the years. Um, the best bound currently is uh, sort of halfway between here and here. This is one over root two plus a little over one to the n. So we thought of Bourgain, uh, Bourgain, Vu, and Wood um, from 2009, maybe. Uh, uh, 2010. Okay, so there's, there's still a little bit of a gap between uh, between the up and low bounds, but we do know that it is now exponentially small. Okay, this of course is consistent with uh, with what I said before, with this linear bound here. Um, that uh, if, you, if you send lambda to zero, you should get an exponential bound, and uh, in fact we have this explicit uh, bound here for the singular case. Um, in, in in for the least singular value in general, we don't have a as good a value here, but um, anyway. It is still explicitly computable. Okay, but uh, okay, I'm not going to prove these, these, these more difficult results. I just want to focus on the um, singularity probability here. Okay, so um, okay, so all right. So I can give you sort of a heuristic proof of of of, of this sort of claim. So um, as I said, it, it's all about playing with the rows. So uh, we think of this matrix as um, as um, a matrix of n rows, where each of these n each of these rows are random. They're random vectors in the unit cube, distributed uniformly and independently. So you, you you pick n vectors in the unit cube, and asking for the singular value to be zero. Okay, so we don't use this this uh, this sort of inf anymore. Um, so uh, we instead um, this uh, the singular value being zero is the same as saying it's the same as asking for the uh, the x's to be uh, to have some linear dependence. Okay, so that, that this matrix is not full rank. Okay, now um, okay. So what that means is, is that one of these these vectors, one of these row vectors, must be a linear combination of the other row vectors. So uh, let's first cheat a little bit. Okay, so um, yeah, so we know that one of these is the linear combination of the others. Uh, let's say that it is uh, the last one. Let's say that xn is a linear combination of, of the first n minus one. Okay, now see, this is not the only possibility. So, so this, this is actually a smaller event than this. So, so these are not quite equal. Um, if you use the union bound, uh, you can very crudely bound this by, et, by this, uh, this probably by, by, by n times this, because we know that one of these, these vectors has to be a linear combination of the others. Um, and by symmetry, it, uh, all these events, so you have n events and they all have the same probability. So up to a factor of n, uh, this is the truth. Uh, but that's not a very good bound, particularly since we're only going to be gaining one over root n. Yeah. But uh, never mind that fact for the moment. Let, let's, let's just assume that. Uh, the way the linear dependence is happening is that the last vector will be a linear combination of, of, the, of the first n minus one. Okay, so, um, so, so these guys will span some space of dimension at most n minus one. So, so let, let's, let's call Vn the span. Okay, so, so the first n minus one rows span some subspace which will probably be n minus one dimensional. We'll, Probably would be a hyperplane, although it could potentially be lower dimensional than that. Okay, so we are, we are asking for the probability that the last vector lies lies in the span of the first n minus one vectors. Okay. Um, now, as I said, typically this would be a, um, a hyperplane. Uh, so let, let's pretend, for, uh, just for sake of argument, that it, it is a hyperplane. Um, now, v n will have some some normal vector. So let's say let's let's call n. Oh, n I'm already using. Oh, that is bad. Uh, omega. Okay, let's call omega the unit vector, unit normal. To be n. Now there are, there might be more than one. Well, okay, there's this up to sign. There's, there may be multiple unit normal. Let's just pick one unit normal. Um, and so this probability being on this on this hyperplane is the same as being orthogonal to a unit normal. So 
So, uh, so th this should basically be the same as, as, as the dot product of Xn with this unit normal being zero. Um, now, if this was, this was a hyper, if Vn was a hyperplane, this is actually equal. If Vn is less, is, is, has lower dimension, then it's not quite equal again. But again, let's pretend that this, that this is what it is. Um, now, this is a rather ugly vector. Okay, so, so this unit normal uh, depends on, in, a, in a complicated way on, on, all the, on the first n minus one rows. Um, I mean, you, you can work out what it is using Kramer's rule. Um, the, the entries of each of this vector, I mean, the, uh, this vector is proportional to a vector where, where the entries are like n minus one by n minus one minus of, of this matrix. So it, it's, it's, it's a bit ugly. Um, so it's gonna, be, it's gonna be quite random because it depends on all these random um, vectors. But the key thing is that it only depends on the first n minus one rows and not on the last row, and these rows are independent. So um, the key thing is that while this is random, this is independent. Of xn, okay. and this is this is what makes this, this argument have a chance of working. Okay, so while this is all this is a very messy uh, uh, random vector with, with a complicated distribution, you're taking the dot product of something which is independent of that. Uh, and that, that's fairly easy to understand. So, so what this is, so Xn, remember, is, is a, by, con by contrast, is a very simple random vector. It's just a, is a vector of, of random signs. And so what we have here is that we just have a random combination of these Ws. Okay, so you, 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 you choose, you, you, you generate these, ran these random numbers, W1 to Wn, omega 1 to omega n, in some complicated fashion, and then you take um, this sort of random walk with those with those signs, and you're asking um, you're asking for the probability that this random walk is um, actually returns back to zero. Okay. Now at this point, um, so th the study of when random walks return to zero is actually something which has been studied for quite a while. Um, it, it, it goes under the, uh, the topic of what's called uh, Littlewood-Offord little, little theory. Okay, so, so Littlewood-Offord theory. It's a study of how random walks such as uh, this random walk that I just wrote down here concentrate. And there are many, many um, theorems at, um, describing uh, computing this probability. Um, so one of the simplest results is uh, due to Erdős, uh, Paul Erdős, not Laszlo here, okay. Um, so uh, so uh, uh, Erdős uh, showed the following simple bound. Okay, so if, uh, if let's say, if k of, the, of these shifts are non-zero, then the probability that this random walk uh, returns to, say, the origin is bounded by a constant of a root k. Okay? That, um, okay, that if you have a random walk, okay. Um, so, of course, uh, you need some sort of non-degeneracy condition, because like, if, if all these weights were zero, then of course the, the probability of this walk goes to zero is one. Um, but the more and more non-zero terms you have in this, um, uh, in, in, in this random walk, the, the rarer and rarer it gets to be able to return to, uh, to zero. And root k is sort of the, uh, um, the, um, the right expression. So for example, suppose all the w, suppose you had k um, uh, non-zero weights and they're all, they all the same, they're all equal to one. Then what you're doing is that you're summing together plus or minus one, plus or minus one, plus or minus one, k times. Um, and that's just a binomial distribution um, which has uh, mean zero and, and uh, standard deviation one over root k, so root k. So the probability that it will return to zero, let's say if k is even, should be something like one over root k. Okay, so this, this is actually the truth. Okay, um, so this is, this is a, a simple uh, theorem. Uh, it, it, it's proven combinatorially. Um, it, it uses a, a tool from combinatorics called Sperner's lemma. Um, uh, you can also prove it uh, using Fourier methods. You, you, uh, you can write this, uh, this expression as, as an integral of a, of a Product of a bunch of cosines, and you can just sort of estimate that product by hand. Um, but let me just take this 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 theorem as a black box uh, for now. Let's, let's not talk about the proof. The proof is sketched in, in, in the notes. 
Um, so anyway, if you believe this, this bound, um, so you have to now divide into two cases um, depending on, on how, uh, how this, this, this vector behaves. So as in the previous lecture, there's sort of an, an incompressible case. And a compressible case. Okay, um, and the, in, in, in this particular, well, so what compressible, incompressible means changes depending on what problem you're working on. This is not really a, a, a fixed definition, but in, in, in this case, um, incompressible means lots of non-zero entries. So you know, incompressible means like a, like a positive fraction of the entries and of, of, um, of the coefficients are non-zero. Okay, and in the compressible case, you know, only a small number, let's say only epsilon n of the entries are non-zero. So your, your vector is very sparse, or your vector is very non-sparse. Okay, so um, if your vector, if, if this normal vector is very, is very non-sparse, then you can just use this, uh, this, this, uh, this bound of Erdős, and this, this will give you the right bound. This will give you the bound of 1 over root n. Okay, so you don't use any randomness in, in the omegas, you just use the randomness of, of, of the signs. Uh, yeah, so of, of course, uh, this Erdős bound uh, for this Erdős bound, uh, you, you can think of the omegas as, as fixed. Uh, for the, this is a, the omegas can be de deterministic as long as it, there's, there's at least k non zeros. Um, this bound of Erdős holds true. Uh, but but once once this is uh, once you've proven this bound for deterministic omega, um, then just by Frobenius theorem, it's also true for random omega as, as long as the random signs are still independent of the uh, uh, of, of the random omegas, which is which is this key thing here. So as long as many of, of these omegas are non zero. Then, um, then you get the right bound. Um, and then there's this remaining case where, the omegas, where the very few of the omegas are, are non-zero. Um, but this case happens very rarely. So this is, this is very rare. OK, so just to give one extreme example, it, it could potentially be that the normal vector is 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, which is a very, very um, compressible vector. But the only way that can happen um, is if, um, actually, that can't happen at all. Uh, so actually, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's make it uh, 1 of root 2, minus 1 of root 2. OK, uh, so this is almost as compressible, uh, this vector here. So the only way this can be a unit normal to Vn, uh, so what that means is that, is that this vector is orthogonal to every single one of these uh, n minus 1 rows here, which, because of this, uh, this form, means that, that this column here the first column and second column are the same. That's, uh, that's, that's what it means for all these vectors to be orthogonal to this vector here. But that's really rare. That's like exponentially rare. Okay, that can only happen with probably something like 2 to the minus n. So, so this particular compressible vector can only occur um, ex an exponentially small number of times. And there are not that many um, compressible vectors lying around. Okay? As, remember, the, the, the intuition is that, is that compressible vectors should, should have low entropy. So, um, so in, when you add that up with the, with the union bound, this should also be small. In fact, much smaller than this. Okay, so, so this, is, this is the general strategy uh, of Kolmlisch's argument. Um, but uh, I had to cheat a few times to, uh, to get here. So, so a couple of things. So, so firstly, um, yeah, um, the, I, when I had the linear dependence, I, uh, um, Okay, I assume that xn was a linear combination of, of all the other vectors, but it, the combination could be something else. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I also cheated a little bit to get to this dot product. Um, and then finally, uh, I didn't quite uh, rigorously show why the compressible case is rare. Okay, so let's, let's start doing that.
Okay, so uh, all right. So let's first deal with the compressible vectors. Okay, so um, all right. Um, so having a compressible um, yeah, so as, as I sort of show this example, having a compressible um, normal vector here is like saying that there's some sparse vector which is orthogonal to many of the columns. Um, so let's actually, uh, so, so let's, let's yes, yeah, so we also need to work with the columns as, as well as the, the rows. Okay, so we, let's, let's call y1 to yn the, um, the n columns of this, of this matrix. And let's, uh, let's compute the probability that that there's a linear, sparse linear relation between these columns. So um, let's look at the probability that, that Mn uh, annihilates a vector x for some non-zero epsilon n sparse x. Okay, so, so there's some vector x which is mostly zero, okay, and only at most epsilon n of these n entries are non-zero, and suppose that there is some um, some uh, uh, vector like this, which uh, which is annihilated by by m. Um, so this is this is the same as saying that there is some linear combination. There is a linear relation, a non-trivial linear relation between the first uh, between the n columns that only involves. Involves uh, less than epsilon n of the columns. Okay, so we're going to compute the probability that that uh, uh, this uh, this matrix has got some short relationship between between the um, between the rows. And by short, it means uh, less than epsilon n. Does that be a good threshold? Okay. So, for example, if you, if uh, if uh, uh, okay, so maybe I'll no, I'll say that next. Okay, so um, we'll start using the union bound. So, so this turns out to be quite small. This will be exponentially small, uh, this, this, this event here. Okay, so it, it involves some number of, 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 uh, of the y's. We can, we can focus on the, the, the shortest relation. So that, um, you can call k the, the shortest, the fewest number of y's which has some linear relation. So um, you can bound this by the sum of all k's up to epsilon n. Of the probability that um, that k of the yi's are linearly dependent, but no k minus one of them are. Okay, so among all the linear relations there are, there's, there's some shortest one, and that shortest one has some length k. So for all k up to epsilon n, we want to compute the probability that, that there's some k of these columns that are uh, linearly related and, and k is minimal. Okay, so for example, if k is two, um, this event is just the event that two of the columns are either the same or negative of each other. And that's a very small event. That, that, that's, like, that's like a two to the minus n times n choose two, something like that. Okay. Um, all right, so how big is this? Um, okay, so, so, so there's, there's at most epsilon n terms here, so I'm just going to crudely bound this by epsilon n. This is, this is a very small entropy cost because I'm going to gain an exponential factor later on, so I, I don't care about, about losing this, this factor. Now, um, what happens here? Um, okay, so, so k of, of these um, columns are going to be independent. Um, now, but which k uh, is not specified? Okay, so we don't know which of the k columns actually are going to have the dependence, and, and, and there are n choose k different K tuples, which could which could carry this dependence, so um, we're just going to use the union bound again. We're going to pay an entropy cost of n choose k for some k uh, in this range, and um, we, uh, in order to to fix the, the specific uh, uh, k columns which are going to be dependent, and because of symmetry, uh, we may as well assume that it's it's the first k columns. So uh, just by the union bound and symmetry, I can bound this by the, by n choose k entropy cost times the prob probability that the first um, k vectors have a, a linear relation, are lin linearly independent, okay, but no k minus one.
OK. All right. Oh, uh, that's what this is. OK, so I guess maybe there's a soup in K. Maybe it's still left here. Okay. You could keep the sum too if you wanted to. It doesn't really matter. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I'm now thinking of K as just being fixed. OK. All right. All right, so what does it mean, mean to be linearly independent? OK, so now we're just looking at, at this skinny matrix, N and K. Um, all right, so, um, OK, so um, the first, yeah, so, so the, the first K columns are linearly, linearly dependent, which means this matrix is not full rank. OK, so um, the rank of this matrix is less than K. In fact, it's exactly K minus 1. Um, so now, actually, uh, the next thing to do is to switch back to the rows. Okay, so um, this matrix has some rows. Um, they're, they're shorter than these rows, so maybe I won't call them Xs, I'll call them Zs. Okay, they're just truncated versions of the Xs. Okay, so if the Ys are linearly, if the Ys are linearly dependent, then um, this matrix has rank less than at most k minus one, which means that's um, which means that there, there, is, uh, um, there exist k rows um, in Z1 up to Zn, uh, no, uh, k minus 1 rows, okay, which span all the other rows. Okay, let, me, let me just check that I'm doing this correctly. Uh, no, that's not what I want to do. Uh, that, that's true, but sorry. Sorry, let's, 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 okay, let's do this differently. Okay, so um, having, having this linear dependence um, means, so this matrix, uh, let me call it MK. Okay, so this means that this, this MK has a null vector, uh, yeah, has a null vector. Okay, that, there, that there's some vector. Okay, so if this matrix uh, has a linear dependence along the columns, then there, there is some vector which is non-zero, which is annihilated by, by MK. That's another, in fact, that's, a, that's an equivalent form of saying that you're linearly dependent. Okay, now, um, so usually, okay, so, um, Okay, so we're trying to find the, the probability that this matrix annihilates some vector. Now, we could, again, try the union bound, okay, and we try to take the union over all different x's, but that's an uncountable set, uh, and that would, that, would, that would be terrible. Um, you could try using nets and so forth, but still, um, the, 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 um, the cost of, of the, many, many x's that could potentially annihilate all these, um, the, the 